So I kind of have this hard on for finding budget gaming laptops with the best bang for your buck. Well, I think I found another one with the Y7000P, but like a professional nipple tweaker, I did have to make a tweak of my own, which I'll explain later in the video. Now, at first glance, you're really not sure whether it's a gaming laptop with a productivity laptop looks or a productivity laptop with a gaming laptop looks because it's sort of in the middle, which means that guy or girl at the office you like might actually believe you're not in fact eating a liter of ice cream with a side of Cheetos for dinner tonight. Like it's got that big backlit Legion logo on the lid with fairly gamery, but not over the top exhaust vent grills. But other than that, it's a pretty damn clean looking gaming laptop. Uh, build quality and materials are really solid, the lid's aluminum, but rests all plastic, which, let's face it, is an acceptable compromise when it comes to budget gaming laptops. It's got a super sturdy center hinged 15 inch 60 hertz 1080p IPS display with lovely thin bezels that puts out 312 nits of brightness and produces 86% sRGB and 56% Adobe RGB. So it's more than good enough for gaming and watching content, but I don't think I'd trust it with color correcting or grading photos and videos. Lenovo's placed like 95% of the IO on the back again, so they've earned another gold star from me with that. They're like, thanks. So we've got a USB-C Gen 1 port, a mini display port, HDMI network port, power port, three USB 3.1 type A ports, and an audio port. Uh, the bottom's got a great open space for the fans to breathe, and after 13 screws, you can pop off the bottom like a pair of dirty diapers and swap out pretty much everything, but I did notice that the wireless card's actually pretty sweet because I was getting better than average speeds and signal strength compared to most other laptops I get in, so I'd probably hang on to that. Now, my review unit came with a one terabyte Seagate hard drive and 128 gig Toshiba NVMe SSD, which you can swap out if you wanted to upgrade, and the 52 watt hour battery did just fine and should get you between four to six solid hours of productivity depending on screen brightness. The two speakers are located at the front, but they're downward facing, and the the audio is about on par with a room full of screaming toddlers, so you'll want to take advantage of that audio port. Uh, the keyboard deck has a nice soft touch coating, but it's a bit of a pain in the ass to clean fingerprints from. Um, the keyboard's backlit, but not RGB, and only has two levels of brightness. Uh, it's nice to type on, I've always liked the U-shaped keys, and I really dig the one7 millimeter key travel distance. Uh, the click pad style touchpad's been just fine, it's a good size, and it's got Windows drivers, so it's consistently accurate, so no complaints here. Gaming performance is is nice and solid, but it didn't start out that way. So like I said before, I had to tweak some nipples. Actually just one. Darn it. Okay, so this is where it gets fun. Now, my review unit came with the Intel i5 8300H, GTX 1050Ti, and 16 gigs of RAM. Now, because the 8300H is a lower powered CPU compared to the typical i7 8750H we see in most other gaming laptops, I wasn't expecting any power or thermal throttling during stress testing, but Silly, silly Jared was wrong again? Yeah, instant power limit throttling with a bit of thermal throttling thrown in to spice things up a bit. Uh, boost clock speeds were all over the place, but averaged out at around 3.4 to 3.5 gigahertz from its actual max boost clock on all four cores of 3.9 gigahertz. And this is pretty noticeable while gaming too, with FPS spikes all over the place. So what I did was use the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility to simply drop the core voltage offset by 0.110 volts and wouldn't you know it, the power limit and thermal throttling was completely gone and I was able to achieve a nice and stable clock speed of 3.88 gigahertz on all four cores or otherwise known as pretty much max boost clock which completely ironed out those FPS spikes giving me a much smoother gaming experience. And the thermals were a bit better too with previous CPU temps as high as 94 degrees with an average of 84 degrees Celsius and then with post undervolting CPU temps as high as 92 degrees but with a slightly better new average of 78 degrees Celsius. Uh, GPU temps never changed throughout, sticking it out at 72 degrees, which is fine. And while performance is cranking and those fans are spinning like a couple of meth heads, under load, they don't get super crazy loud at around 45 dB and at idle when they do spin up from time to time, they stay pretty quiet at around 31 dB. So now that you know all that, um, although I don't normally like recommending gaming laptops at both thermal and power limit throttle and don't expect most users to go in and under the CPU. It's just so bloody easy to achieve max boost clock with such an easy tweak that for just under $1,100, I'd have to say it's worth consideration. 
if it weren't for the fact that for $1,100, you can get the Acer Helios 300 with the Core i7 8750H and a GTX 1060. So I'll leave that one up to you. But that's it for this one. Uh, don't forget to follow me on Instagram for behind the scenes shenanigans and videos of me killing spiders with a rocket launcher. Hopefully you liked the video. If you did, it sure would be swell if you could show me some love with that like button. And if you're new to my stuff, don't forget to subscribe for new videos every week. But thanks as always for watching and I'll talk to you on the next one. Cheers.